So my, my talk is about uh, trying to be profitable in the soybean production with with the situations that we currently have. Uh, can you put me on the the big screen? Down there at the bottom? Yeah, you know where you've done this. Cliff's an old extension guy. He knows all the tricks. All right, so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing. You know, red band was obviously a big issue for us. And when you're looking at, you know, we had a lot of growers in South Arkansas where Lane and Matt Farm uh, sprayed four times for red band stink bug this past season. That's not sustainable. We can't, we can't live with that. That's not, that's not going to work for us. But let's see as we go through here if we can find some ways that maybe you can consider uh, about maybe changing some of the practices that you are currently doing and find some ways that we can uh, be a little more profitable and get a little better return on our investment. You know, things are changing out there. Our, our technology is changing. Our systems are changing. We're seeing big shifts in crop, uh, crops across acreages now. The increased cost of production, I don't need to tell anybody about that. Uh, certainly our cost of production has skyrocketed in recent years. The cost of seed, all that kind of stuff has just continually gone up. And that's resulted in, for us as, as Extension University people, is the need to reevaluate uh, everything that we do, uh, the recommendations that we make to you to be profitable have to change we have to maintain profitability for our growers and if we don't do that then we're not doing our job so this is the part of it that that we constantly keep in mind that we are here to serve the growers of this state and for us in Arkansas and, and for all the guys in the Mid-South we need to look at our our thresholds and the way that we're spraying the keys that we're that we're using to make those decisions on when to treat and when not to treat. Certainly for us in Arkansas and, and, and most of the Mid-South, you know, bowworms are, are our primary pest, and they have been. Now, Red Band made a big charge on us this, this last season, but year in, year out for the state of Arkansas, bowworms are the most damaging pest that we have, and that's because they feed on the pods. And so getting a good handle on bowworm control is essential for us. And that's why we came up with this threshold. And, you know, a threshold ought to be more than just the number of worms in the sack after you make 25 sweeps. you got to take into account the value of that crop. You know, if, you got, if you're getting $6 a bushel for your beans or $14 or $15, that makes a difference. And, and when you look at the cost of control, these are the issues that come in more so than just the number of worms that you got in that sweep net when you make your 25 sweeps. So what the Mid-South group did was take into account those different prices that you may get in a given year and you match that up with a, with a, a price and then you look at your cost of control and with this system, you can see as your value goes up for your beans, the threshold goes down, right? That's just common sense. Uh, we can't spray nine per 25 uh, bowl worms when we're getting $14, $15 a bushel. I'm looking for those days to come back, you know, when we get that much for our beans. But right now, if you're looking at about $9 a bushel and your cost of control is about 16 to 18, then you're right in that nine per 25. But that's how it can fluctuate. You can see as the price goes up, that number of worms that you gotta have in that sack to make that decision is gonna go down. And that's the way it works. That's how you make money in beans. So, you know, not, you said ask questions as we go. Yeah. Would that not also be the same case in the expected yield of the field? You got a field that, that might make 50 to 60 top end? Or Absolutely. If you got yield potential and you feel comfortable knowing that that field's got 100 bushel yield potential, I might play with that a little different than I would with one that's on some gummy ground that's, you know, 30, 40 bushel yield potential. I think you have to take that into account. Absolutely. 
And that's why you hired Rob Dedman to make, help you make those decisions and take that stuff into account. So the better the consultant is and knowing all the facts about that field and the, and the history of that field helps you make that decision. Now what we got out there right now is a bunch of growers that, that make uh, applications of insecticides based on timing rather than on numbers in the sweep net. We all know there's people out there when, uh, when we're at R3 and you're making that fungicide application, well you want to say, well I'm, I'm going to go ahead and throw something in the tank with my fungicide because I'm going across the field, it's convenient, I might as well do that. You may not have any insects out there to spray, but you go ahead and throw something in the tank. Now who does that in here? Got some liars in here, don't I? <laughs> you know you do it. You know people that do do it. You may not admit it. But there's people that do it, and that's why we did this study. This is what we call our one and done. This is the one and done trial. And you see my locations across here. We got one, uh, in this case, at Crawfordsville, one at Mariana. And you can see what I got is my treatments. This is a large block study that we did where we had Prevathon, at 14 ounces plus a fungicide, you can see what the fungicides were down here. And then Prevathon alone was another treatment, just the fungicide in this one, and then treat only as needed. And then I came in on some of them where I had a two-shot deal, where I sprayed at R3 with the fungicide plus the Prevathon, and then came back at R5 and put another fungicide, because you know, the, the company's got y'all to put an R3 fungicide application out automatically, so that wasn't good enough. Now we're putting two out. So what's next? Three, four, how many are we going to put out there? So this is the thing to think about. So we went back and we started putting these plots out. We started looking at our results. And in some cases, you know, regardless of what I put out there, I didn't get any yield response. So tell me, what is a shot of fungicide and Prevathon at 14 ounces. How much does that cost? Anybody? $35. 35 bucks. Plus application, right? <clears throat> so you're looking at a $40 shot for what? So if I'm throwing my... This is a, like a 14 minimum, maybe $18 per acre, $18 per acre that I'm throwing out there and when you look across you don't see a lot of value associated with making an application of an insecticide when you don't have bugs out there. That's what this is telling you. Save your money for when you need to spray and, and spray the bugs that you need to. Sometimes with those, what we got into when I started doing this was I started getting a bang with my, with my fungicides applications at R3. I did see a, a consistent yield increase a lot of times with with these locations and there's there's the miles that's Lane down there on the end and he got he got a little bit with the double shot compared to the treat on and guess what on my treat is needed I never hit threshold on any field in three years that I did this trial but I consistently got an increase a lot of times with that with that uh, shot of fungicide right there you see it you get a shot with that fungicide you get an increase in yield with the fungicide shot I don't get it with the Prevathon very often every once in a while I'd hit one but you can see there where I got my two shots on these two locations I got a pretty good healthy bump with the two shots of fungicide sometimes you get it sometimes you don't why why are you getting a increase in yield sometimes with a fungicide shot and not other times Cliff, what would you say? Disease pressure and environment. Disease pressure, environment, and variety. Variety. So picking the varieties that don't need fungicide applications, and I can automatically make some money just by picking the right varieties that have some tolerance to frog eye and that kind of stuff and make those shots. This is this past season, and you can see Miles down there. We got, again, we got another shot with the fungicide. Got an increase in yield compared not so much uh, there 
uh, as we did like some of these other locations, we got a good shot with two shots at at West Higginbotham's at Mariana. We got a good healthy increase with two shots of fungicide. So I don't know what the secret is. You have to talk to the plant pathologist. I'm not a I'm not a plant pathologist. I'm not a fungus guy, but there certainly seems to be some value to those fungicide applications at times, particularly on the if you have the right variety that's that's got problems. Now one of the things that we've been looking at, if you're one of those people that's got to throw something in the tank, you know, instead of putting a pyrethroid out or something at R3 or a $20 shot of Prevathon or, or Besiege or something like that, this is a product that we've been looking at for the last couple of years, few years, actually about three or four years. And it's a virus. It's called here in PV. It's a live organism. It, it kills bow worms. That's all it kills. It kills bow worms and bud worms. It's very specific. It costs about three bucks, three to four bucks an acre. And if you just got to go with something in the tank at that R3 fungicide application, why not use something that's not going to stir up, stir up the other pest out there and put a, put a a fungus or a, a, this virus out there and uh, use it but there's some keys that we found if you want to look at this virus and make it work for you we found out that it's very very important that you do some some things it is a live organism so you you throw a jug of virus in the back of your truck and leave it back there for two weeks it's going to be dead in a couple of weeks it's a live organism uh, so you can't you can't treat it like you do other things. You can tank mix it with just about anything. Uh, no problems there, no fungicide issues or anything mixing it with other stuff. It doesn't seem to have any problems. But, and what we find is we got people that are using it when they don't have bow worms. And so identification is key. You got to know you got some bow worms out there. The thing that we've found with this product is you don't treat a raging population. If you're at threshold, don't use virus. If you're at that seven to nine per 25 and you got a bunch of big worms out there, you can't use it. You gotta use it early. You gotta get out in front of them when you got about three to five small larvae, not big larvae, cause it doesn't kill big worms. It doesn't kill them. So you gotta get it out early. But if you get it out in front of them, you start seeing these worms out there in the field behind these applications. And we, we've proven that it has a longevity in the field of about 21 to 30 days. So once I spray it, it's out there in that, in that canopy providing control of bow worms and bud worms, which are the number one pests that we have. And it works extremely well in that situation. Who sounds that? It's made by Ag Biotech, and there's another company called Andermat. So there's two or three different sources of it, Matt. Uh, but Ag Biotech sells it, and most there's people that carry it all through the state, and they have for the last couple of years. But I see people putting it out on raging populations, and then they say it doesn't work. You know, uh, if you put it out on big worms, you're not going to be happy with it. You got to be out in front of it, and that's why you got a good consultant that catches those worms when they're small and, and the numbers aren't that bad. And then you can get this stuff and get it in the system and it'll be out there for a while providing the level of control that we, that we want. We got interested in looking at it when we put it out on one side of the field. In five to seven days, I was seeing it all the way across the field. How'd it get over there? And so I had a student uh, that just graduated that did his thesis on how this thing spread so fast, so quickly across the field. And we found out there's a lot of insects out there that feed on those cadavers when they start to die, those larvae start to die in the field. There's a bunch of insects, three-cornered alfalfa hoppers, bean leaf beetles, all these insects. They actually feed on that dying larva and they spread it all around the field. And that's how it gets spread across the field. It's pretty interesting. We found 13 new families of insects that help transmit this virus. If you had a few big worms and then some small worms, would you tank mix it or could you or would you? Or? Yeah, you can tank mix it just so you got something out there in the system to give you some time. Uh, 
if you but I, what I'm trying to do is find a way to for you to avoid spending the money I'm trying to find a way for you for you to do that without spending 20 bucks on a diamide and I think this this can do that if you use it right and time it right but the timing is very very critical on this thing and realize you know for most consultants and growers they want to spray something and walk out three days later and not see any worms and that doesn't happen with this virus it takes some time for it to spread and do its job but I keep looking at that three four dollar price tag on it and I think there's some value to it you know I'd rather spend three or four dollars to get bollworms under control than than twenty or twenty five dollars so it's got some 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 real use I think for us in in the mid-south particularly in Arkansas where bollworms appear to be worse for our growers than anywhere else in in the mid-south and I think that's because of the big acreage that we got and the time that we plant we start planting in March and we plant all the way through July you know so we got this wide range of acreage that uh, and it's usually those late planted fields that these bollworms get bad in but this is a way for us to to find an alternative and and reduce our amount of money that we're spending but here's the keys to the success with this with this product uh, you got to keep it cool you get it, realize that it only kills bollworm budworm you got to target that you got a new threshold with this with this product it's not that seven and nine you got to catch them when they're small uh, target those larvae when they're less than a half inch for sure and realize that it takes time and you got to be patient with it but it does work we've never seen a failure with it yet so uh, it does have some use okay how cool does it need to stay 77 degrees you know we'll keep it the longevity now when they when the when the company brings it in like your company if they brought it in they're going to keep it in a cooler and they store it at about 34 degrees and it'll last indefinitely at that time it doesn't have any breakdown at that temperature but once you take it out and you put it you know put it in the shop and and leave it in the shade where it stays cool and keep it out of direct sunlight because uv light breaks it down so once you put it in the field it starts degrading okay but we pick it up for about 21 to 30 days after application i can still find it in the field okay are you increasing worms while that's I mean, you still find it but is the worm population increasing at those times well once this virus gets started what we see is this horizontal transmission so you may have a few worms that that get through a little bit so you might see them for some time but usually once this virus is they feed it they ingest it it goes into their body and it starts breaking down the mid gut epithelium and so they quit eating so you may see them out there but they're not feeding okay yes. all right yes. so yes you know your, your graduate student you know showed how you know, all the number of different families spread in around the field what about reducing costs even more by just doing perimeters or stripping fields and yeah, we've talked about it because of the spread, the way it spreads, that, that it's possible that you could put it out like on a grid pattern mm -hmm. and see it. it's going to move. We know it's going to move. We've had great success watching that movement. Uh, so we know it's going to spread. But, you know, I most of the times if they're going across the field with a fungicide application, they're not going to grid it. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to they're gonna spray the whole field because they want to get the fungicide on everything. So it depends on the on the situation. If you were just going out there and spraying bollworms and you caught them plenty early, it'd be fine to grid to grid <coughs> spray it. Yeah. All right. So one of the things that we've been noticing the last couple of years, I sent several populations down to Jeff uh, down in at LSU. What we're seeing with soybean loopers, I'm concerned. We we've been fighting this worm for the past couple of years. Been a problem. And just to show you how important insecticide selection is this is your pyrethroid there's your untreated check you spray the wrong thing you make them worse why kill all, the kill all the beneficials that's exactly right but what concerns me the most about this is now I've, I've got a population of 50 on 25 or per 10 row feet this is on per 10 row feet I've got about 50 in my pyrethroid about 40 
45 in my in my untreated check I'm knocking them down with besieging Prevathon but I'm only getting about 60 percent control so my message to you is we're seeing a shift we're seeing some tolerance we're seeing some resistance based on the populations that I sent to LSU we're looking at uh, 20 30 fold resistance with diamides right now on soybean loopers in the mid-south they've already quit recommending diamides in the southeast like Georgia South Carolina North Carolina they're not getting any control over there at all so as we move into the future when you make an application and you got loopers be be concerned that that we're not getting the kind of control with the diamides that we used to get, we're seeing a drop off. This is Intrepid Edge and Steward right here. Steward's an old product, some of you may remember, in Doxicar, but it's it's providing, still providing a good level of control and the Intrepid Edge is much superior to the control that we're getting right now for soybean looper uh, compared to Besiege and Prevathon. Here's just another trial that I did, same kind of results. Uh, there's your Besiege, that, that Troubadour, that's yours, Jason, right? Yes, sir. Looks pretty good. That's a that's a uh, intrepid methoxyphenazide. It's the same thing, and you can see the control is is pretty decent. But still, the better products are right down here. The intrepid edge at both rates look extremely good. The eight ounces of Troubadour or intrepid look pretty good, uh, but certainly we're seeing a shift. In, in the susceptibility of soybean loopers for control and it's something for you to keep in mind. Red band's the big one. That's the problem that we've been having and dealing with and I want to I really want to concentrate on it a little bit. We got a lot of misidentification out there. A lot of people uh, sending me pictures of stuff and, and uh, thinking they had red band when they didn't. And if you were here earlier when Angus and them were talking, you know how problematic this pest is but I want to show you what these things look like because like I said there's a lot of misidentification on these things this is what the nymphs look like and you can see they come out red then they get the red stripe and then they, as they progress they get bigger you can see how they change in color and, and the shape and all that kind of stuff and and we had a lot of people thinking they had uh, red bands when they had predatory stink bugs. I got people spraying predatory stink bugs. You know, we can't do that. We got to get our ID down. We got to be able to identify this. And it, as you've seen, there's a lot of other insect, the, the red shoulder uh, stink bug, which is not a problem for us that much, looks very similar. It's got the same red band across there that the red banded stink bug has, but it's uh, shaped different. But this is the key. When you send me a picture of a red banded stink bug, don't show me this part. Turn it over. I want to look at that spine right there. That's your key for red banded stink bug control. We still got a lot of people that are confused about that. But I want to show you some of the damage that we, that we saw this year in Arkansas and how we went about controlling it. This is a field right down at about uh, Fresno, uh, Star City, uh, Lincoln County, that the grower let the stink bugs get by. Uh, Dwayne Beatty is the one who put me on this field. And you can see the damage on those pods. When you start seeing that and that spot on that bean right there, and then you open up some of the older beans, you see those black spots. Uh, this is red banded stink bug damage don't let anybody kid you these things are totally different the biggest mistake that I saw with growers is thinking that these stink bugs are just like the other stink bugs because they're not not in any way and this is a damage scale that we developed uh, and you can see a, a clean bean a little bit of damage increasing damage till finally you see a bunch of blank pods out there in the field if you let them get away from you we did several, several studies, but this one typifies uh, the efficacy that we saw across locations. And the thing I want to show you is this is a study at Mariana. I started out with about 40 stink bugs on 25 sweeps in my untreated check. And this is about six days after application, and you can see the products that I'm dealing with. And what you see there is, you know, pretty good control with most everything. Uh, 
a lot of people were trying to go cheap and go with a lower rate of bifenthrin. Obviously not a good choice. But look at my key, look at my y-axis now. In a, in a matter of six days to 11 days, that's five days, I went from 40 stink bugs in that last slide right there. Five days later, I'm at 120. Just to give you an idea of the reproductive potential of this pest and how they move into a field. And you can see the control there, but what you see is a predominance of tank mix products that are providing the best level of control. And that's what we encouraged everyone to do as we went through this season is to tank mix. Tank mix applications for red band are always better than single product applications every time, every time. So we get out to the, to the end after 10 days after the second application and you can see most of the products that you're going to see down here on this end are the ones that got something tank mixed with them. So these are the products that are working for us and giving us the best level of control as you can see as you go through there. And the bifenthrin belay and bifenthrin acephate, that's, that's the two products uh, you know that I would tell you bifenthrin acephate was probably used on most of the acreage and did extremely well. But that's what it takes to get those numbers down. And, and the other point is once we get them, when you find them and they're out of control and you can spray twice, What's our threshold? About four per 25. So I've sprayed twice and I still got 50 on 25. So once you let these things get away from you, trying to get them back under control is almost impossible. And that's the key to control on this pest is catching them early and getting them before they get away from you. If you let this red band get away from you, it's gonna eat you alive. And just to show you what the visual is on those plots, where you see the beans cutting out is where I sprayed. Those little green spots all through there, those are my untreated checks. So the definite impact on delayed maturity with this, with this insect, and the reason was we went out and looked at those places where I still got green, and it's because I got a bunch of blank pods out there. So they're blanking pods, and when, they're, when you blank a bunch of pods, there's no stress on that plant to go ahead and cut out and finish up. And so it delays maturity, not only reduces yield, but delays maturity significantly. So it can have a huge impact on you. We're finding out that there's a lot of other host plants than what we were told. We're seeing them in cotton. That's Milo. I saw them on late season Milo this year, <clears throat> built up in huge numbers, and they're scarring that plant up. You can tell they're causing damage. Now the one major host for this thing, particularly as we go into the spring this year in March and, and early April, is that crimson clover. That's going to be what tells us how good a job we did this winter with our cold weather. That's what we're going to be keying on. We're going to be looking at those, at this crimson clover on the ditch banks and in the medians and that kind of stuff on the highways and looking at that crimson clover in your cover crops, you guys. It, that are big on cover crops and, you, and you're big on uh, Austrian winter field peas and crimson clover in your cover crop deal, you're helping raise red bands in those cover crops, so just be advised. Coffee bean, that's a big, big one. They love coffee bean. Late in the season, you can walk up to a six foot tall coffee bean out in the field and look at it and not see anything and then shake it like that, and there'll be 30, 40 red band stink bugs fall off of it. That's a good way to tell if you got a problem. That's a good indicator plant. If you want to walk into a field and see if red band's an issue, go out and shake the coffee bean around it, because they'll be there. So what makes this stink bug so special? It's that damage that they cause, and you can see this is another shot where this was left out sprayed on either side of it just to show you the impact of this red band stink bug on our soybeans. We don't see any differences in feeding really. Uh, you know, they, we were told that they had a huge mouthpiece, mouth part, they don't. It's not even bigger than any other uh, stink bugs. But the damage is caused by that toxin in their saliva that they use to, to take the, the juice up through, the, through their mouth part. That's where the damage occurs with this pest. 
it's that enzyme that, that really causes the problem. They do probe deeper into the seed. We did see that. But our traditional threshold for all the other stink bugs is nine per 25 or one per row foot on a shake sheet. We double that number at R6 and terminate at R6 and a half, walk away from the field. Well, we found out real quick you can't do that so much in, with red band. But based on a lot of work that Nick Sider or uh, Nick and uh, Bateman, the new entomologist that we're working with here in Arkansas, uh, we did a lot of tests where we went out and caged beans and stuck a bunch of stink bugs out there with them. And uh, we found out that the damage after about R6 and a half, R7, I can raise that threshold. So this is going to be our new recommendation as we go into 2018. I'm going to up that threshold from 4 per 25 up to 10 per 25. So it's still not great, but it's better than what we were telling you last year. I had people going out spraying R7, R8 beans because we were running scared. This is what we were told from the folks at LSU. And so we realized we had to do our own work and that's what we did. We, we about killed ourselves putting cages out and infesting with stink, these red band stink bugs and, and looking at the damage. But we feel very comfortable right now with that 10 red banded stink bugs per 25 sweeps once you get to R6 and a half and R7, okay? So that's a lot better than where we were this, this past season. So what the question I've been I've probably had ten times today is what's the weather done for us? What's the weather done for reducing these numbers of red bands? What we've been told is seven hours at 20 degrees will kill 90 percent of the population. Seven days at 32 degrees kills 95 percent of the population. This is the weather that we had. This is McGee, Stuttgart, and Jonesboro consecutive hours less than 20 degrees 17 hours Matt that's y'all uh, there's Stuttgart 36 hours and there's Jonesboro up in northeast Arkansas at 58 hours so we got a considerable good kill we think right now based on what we know enough to the point where we're not going to deal with them like we did in 2017 but to tell you that we're going to zero out on them, I'm not comfortable with that at this point. That's why that ditch bank survey that we do every year, starting from now on, we'll be doing this from now on because it's a good indicator of us. Because last year we went out in March and April and we were sweeping these ditch banks. And I was finding very often anywhere between 40 to 60 per 100 sweeps. So that's, that's my base. And I'll work from there. This this spring we'll get out and we'll be sweeping like crazy all up and down the state. Glenn Studebaker will be doing northeast. I'll be doing the central part of the state. Nick and I will be doing the south part of the state now since Nick Sider's left us. So we'll be covering all these areas up through the state and we'll be sweeping, sweeping the hell out of crimson clover and trying to find out if we can find any red bands because we're, we're too concerned about this problem. Uh, it's too much of a, a, a issue for our growers to let it go. So here's the key on this. All I learned about red banded stink bug, I can sum it up right here. If I'm at R5 or earlier, R4, R5, and I'm running four per 25 sweeps, you better spray it. You best spray that field if you're running four per 25. Uh, R5 is the key. Getting in there and getting those things knocked down before you get in the field is, in, is, is, is critical and, st and stopping that delayed maturity. But we're going we're gonna to hike our threshold up once we get to this level. We're not going to spray for that anymore. We're not going to do that. We're not going to spend your money. Uh, we, at least we got that much learned. We, we still got a lot to learn. Uh, we saw some some fungi out there that were taking populations out we're excited about that maybe some potential for that but uh, there's a lot to go on this anybody using the cover crop this year okay so what I see with cover crops I'm going to hit this with two slides you know we tell you 
three to four weeks prior to planting, you got to burn that cover crop down. And the more we see, the more I'm convinced that we're right on target with that. If you got growers that want to roll it and plant right into it, they're making a big, big mistake based on insects. And uh, if you're going to do that, then let's put a let's put a pyrethroid or something behind the planter, and and go ahead and and it's probably going to have to be an automatic application but you've got to avoid that green bridge as much as possible wait until the last minute to burn that cover crop down is a bad I saw some horror stories this last season I saw more cover I saw more cover crop issues this past season than I ever before I couldn't count the cutworms in some of these fields literally could not count how many cutworms there were out there per row foot. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I've never seen that many cutworms and the issues with uh, pea weevils and three corn, three, everything, absolutely. There's so many pests that come in on these, on these cover crops. They're great, cover crops are great. I'm not trying to tell you not to use them, but if you're gonna do it, you had best adhere to that three to four weeks and if you can't do that, then you better be prepared to spray, okay? Did you see that with just one cover crop or with people that were planting a, a mixture? The mixtures are, are obviously a little worse and it's if you got a broad leaf in there a lot of times. You know, and, and my, my, my story to people is if you're planting a, a broad leaf crop, don't put a broad leaf cover crop in it. You know, and if you're using a, if you're going to plant corn behind it, then don't use a cereal cover crop. What I saw with cereal cover crops is they plant like rye or something like that, and the the uh, wire worms and grubs are so bad in the soil that they eat the roots off the corn before it even comes up. I mean, it's tremendous. So what I would tell you is if, if, you're, if you're using a, a mixture and you got a lot of broadleaf in there like crimson clover or, or Austrian winter field peas, be advised that you can get into some really pea weevils. I had a guy call me last year from North Carolina and he said, I, I was Googling this, this problem I got and your name popped up. And, and I said, well, what do you got? And he said, I got these, they call them pea weevils. And I said, yes, sir. I said, have you sprayed them? And he said, oh, four times. I've sprayed four times to get these pea weevils under control and I can't get them and they're eating my crop to the ground. He started crying on the phone. This farmer started crying on the phone to me. He said, I can't get them under control. I got 500 acres of beans. I'm fixing to lose them and I can't do anything. I keep spraying them and they keep coming back. And I said, did you use a seed treatment? He said, no, I didn't use a seed treatment. Well, let me tell you something. If you're going to use a cover crop, you had best use a seed tree. You want to avoid that green bridge at all costs, but you use an insecticide treatment regardless. <coughs> you put some cruiser or nips it or I don't care, but you put something on that seed. You got me? Don't mess that up. And if you got a consultant or you got to do it yourself, you scout early and often. Early and often when that before that crop comes out of the ground and you be looking for cut worms, pea weevils, all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of problems that can occur with this thing, but you know, and always spray when you need to spray, avoid the automatic applications, you know, that IPM thing. You know what I'm talking about? Spray when you need to, uh, avoid problems. But my advice is to, if you're gonna get in these cover crops, ease into it and figure it out because Everything we know about cover crops comes out of the Midwest. They don't like the problems up there. I worked with a grower in Stuttgart this year. He called. They called me out there to look at. I've never seen cutworm as bad as he had in that field. They were cutting every bean in a 70-acre field. They were cutting it down to the ground. They were eating the seed before it even before it even emerged. And he said, you know, I've, I've used cover crops all my life. I'd never seen nothing like this. And I said, I could tell he wasn't from Arkansas because he didn't talk like me. <laughs> and I said, where, where are you from? And he said, Iowa. And I said, where are you go? You know, it's a different world down here. You know, we got problems. And he said, yeah, I'm learning that. 
but he lost his stand on that field because the cut worms were so thick. I've never seen anything. You pull that mat back, just flop it over, and you couldn't count the cut worms in a given area. Seriously. So if you're going to get into this, just be advised, okay? If you need to contact me, there's lots of ways we put information out. Uh, I'm on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter. we got the blog and that pest patrol hotline that I do every week where I talk and tell you what's going on. That's where you're going to hear about red bands and whether they're surviving this year and that kind of stuff. But if you need, if you need to get on that, that's how you do it. You text that number and you, in the text you put pest pat six and, that, and that'll put you on the line. And, and every week when I give a report on what's going on in the crops in Arkansas, you can, uh, you can hear about it from me. So that's all I got. Anybody got any questions? How yes, sir. Far, how far north has the red banded stink bugs moved? All the way up in the boot hill of Missouri and, and up in Tennessee. And I think they even said they got a few up in Kentucky this past season. So they have moved their range. Now, if this weather, certainly the weather's particularly up in Jonesboro, I think that area is going to be pretty safe. Todd, you ought to be pretty good shape. <coughs> Uh, they were spotty. When it got up to northeast Arkansas where you are, they kind of got spotty. But Matt will tell you they're not spotty down there. They're not spotty in the south half of the state. They were everywhere, every field. And they were bad. And they cost growers, you know, four applications. What are we talking about? 50, 60 bucks an acre? We can't live with that. <coughs> Soybeans are not that profitable. We can't do this. So we got to find some ways to keep control, and that's the key: is plant early, plant early mature and variety as much as you can. Avoid late planted soybeans at all cost, and and control those stink bugs at R5. That's the key to this: is is controlling that stink bug before they get away from you. Because once they get away from you, you can't get them back under control. They're kind of like boll weevils back in the old days in cotton. They're the new bow weevil. When we sprayed it many times with an April planted bean. Yeah. I could imagine if we'd been behind weeds. Yeah, it'd been a nightmare. It was for the people that planted late down there. They couldn't get them under control. And you could spray. I had one guy, I walked on a guy's farm down at McGee, out by you. And I walked in this guy's farm and he said, uh, he said, I, I just finished my fourth application on this field. I, it was five days ago. And I walked in the field, it was late in the season, and we started sweeping. And we're running anywhere from 50 to 100 red bands on 25 sweeps, and he just sprayed five days ago. But every field around him had been cut. They'd cut every soybean field around him, and all those stink bugs picked up and moved into his field. So when you're the last, you don't want to be last. <laughs> don't be last. Okay. Anybody else? Any more? I appreciate y'all coming and spending the time with me. Thank you.